Welcome, mothers and others. Today, we are so excited to bring you Luke Warford, who is fighting to become Texas's next railroad commissioner, which actually has nothing to do with railroads and everything to do with overseeing the oil and the gas industry. The Texas Railroad Commission has played a major role in 2021 with the grid failure by neglecting to enforce weatherization requirements. So welcome, Luke Warford. I'll just hand it over to you if you want to introduce yourself to the group. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Warford. I'm the Democratic nominee for the Texas Railroad Commission. Uh, it is just so good to be with you all. And um, I'm excited for the conversation and think just incredibly highly of the work that Mothers Against Greg Abbott is doing and looking forward to continuing to work with you all to kick some ass and win some elections this November. So, uh, yeah, great to be here. And thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you so much, Luke. So you just got off this really great eight day tour, right? And you kicked off in Beaumont, Texas on August the 15th with a goal of educating Texans on the role of the Railroad Commission and its impact on every single everyday issues like utility bills and keeping the lights on and the future of Texas economically and the environment as well. So um, so I have a couple of questions for you about this tour. First of all, can you just tell us a little bit about your tour and what you're doing to educate Texans about how important your role is? Absolutely. So um, we just got back from something called the Great Texas Train Tour. And what we did is we took a train all the way from Beaumont to El Paso. Um, and you might be saying to yourself, well, the Railroad Commission has nothing to do with trains. And you'd be right. Um, but what we did is we took this train tour to draw attention to that fact and to educate Texans about what the Railroad Commission actually does, because it's this incredibly important office, incredibly important statewide office that a lot of people don't know about, um, but that has a huge impact on Texans' lives, whether it's our ability to keep the lights on, how much we're paying for utility bills or the future of our planet and climate change and our emissions. And so we, what we did is you can actually take a train from Beaumont all the way in East Texas, all the way to El Paso. And we started in Beaumont um, and, and sort of told the story of Texas oil and gas with different stops along the way. And we started at uh, Spindletop, which is where oil and gas was the first major oil and gas discovery in Texas in 1901, visited the port of Beaumont, went to Houston where we met with entrepreneurs and innovators who are working uh, on a lot of solutions with the future of Texas energy and where our, tech, our energy economy is going. We went to San Antonio where we met with uh, oil and gas producers and landowners in South Texas about the challenges that they face with the Texas Railroad Commission, went to Alpine and then up to the Permian Basin met with voters who were dealing with high utility prices, talked to folks who were working in the produced water recycling industry, working on issues of, of water and clean water and how we reuse water in the Permian, which is a massive issue uh, out there, and then continued on uh, from Alpine to El Paso, where we wrapped up talking about the uh, meeting with the El Paso utility and talking about um, sort of the impact on rising natural gas prices on their ability to provide Texans affordable energy out there. And the, you know, the goal of the tour was one, to talk to folks and educate them about what the Railroad Commission does, but also just to tell a good story, right? We've got this massively important elected office in the Texas Railroad Commission. And my opponent, Wayne Christian, doesn't want you to know what he's doing. He doesn't want you to know the impact that he has in his life. And so we brought a cardboard cutout of Wayne and, you know, have been, have asked him, invited him in a friendly way uh, every day for the last 49 days to debate us. Uh, he has not yet taken us up on it, um, but the, the tour was great. It was a great opportunity to connect with folks across the state and feeling really good about, about that and where we are and sort of the prospects for the next two months of the campaign. So one of the funniest things that I just get such a kick out of, instead of like, where's Waldo? It's been like, where's Wayne Christian? <laughs> it's been yeah. hilarious, like so incredibly funny. So where is Wayne? I mean, has he shown up anywhere? Because it just doesn't seem like he's campaigning at all. Well, that's the thing, right? And we this is a, a pattern across the Texas Railroad Commission, but in particular with Wayne Christian. And 
I'm going to take the opportunity just to talk about him a little for folks. Well, let's do. Yeah, let's dish. So I'm, uh, you know, 33 year old, first time candidate, uh, you know, trying to run to, to make a difference at the Texas Railroad Commission. I know we're going to talk more about my background. My opponent is a mid 70s career politician. He's been in elected office since uh, I was eight years old. He is a former member of the legislature who won the award for worst legislator in the state twice. He's uh, takes 99% of his campaign contributions from the oil and gas industry that he's supposed to be holding accountable, um, has said that he thinks the answer to climate change is to turn up the air conditioning. That's a real quote. Um, and was directly responsible for last February's grid failure, something that a lot of Texans don't realize is that it was the Railroad Commission job to create a weatherization rule to make sure our natural gas producers prepared for cold weather. They didn't do that. And then that, that was one of the biggest individual causes of failure. And the thing is, is that all of the decisions that the Railroad Commission is making, it's having a real impact on Texans. And the office is deliberately misnamed. It's operating in the shadows. There's no transparency and there's no accountability. And that's not an accident. Wayne doesn't want you to know who he is. He wants to get away with the same thing they did during last February's winter storm, which is <clears throat> helping their donors make billions of dollars in profits, passing those costs onto Texans that we're paying off for decades going forward and not being held accountable. And so one of the reasons I'm running is because we have an opportunity to actually hold him accountable this November and vote in uh, uh, some leadership that actually cares about Texans and wants to do the job. Yeah, that's great. So let's talk about, you know, you just you just touched on it just a tad. You mentioned that the current railroad commissioners, like they're, they're making some profits off of the industry that they're supposed to regulate. So that's one of the things that is, seems to be a little shady. So, um, so what, um, the other folks that are also railroad commissioners are Christy Craddock and Jim Wright. So what is the combination of the three, what's really going on with this administration that they seem to be taking a lot of, a lot of money, you know, and filling up their pocketbooks with it from oil and gas? Well, I think, and, and looking at the numbers across the three of them, on average, they take about 70% of their campaign contributions from the oil and gas executives who are funding their, uh, from the oil and gas executives they're supposed to regulate. And that on its face is too high a number, right? Nobody would look at that, regardless of your party affiliation and say, oh yeah, that's okay. That's not a conflict of interest. I mean, it's such a clear case of the fox guarding the hen house. Um, when you look at my opponent, Wayne Christian, in the styling period, 99.6% of the campaign contributions that he received came from oil and gas executives and corporate PACs. And so he's just taking it even more to a next level. But I think what we've got is we've got a system that has been set up and designed to enrich oil and gas executives, pipeline executives in particular, who then fund the campaigns of the people who let them get away with it, who the Railroad Commission, let's just be really clear, was founded to prevent monopoly behavior, was founded to prevent the, the types of price gouging that we saw during last February's winter storm. But instead, we've got an agency that is totally captured by the folks that they're trying to hold accountable. And there hasn't been any consequences for a long time. But again, coming back to, you know, a question uh, I actually get asked fairly, fairly regularly is, well, hasn't anyone hold it, held these, these failed leaders accountable for the grid failure? It's such a massive and egregious failure leadership. The thing that I always say is we can, we have an opportunity to do so this November, whether it's getting Beto O'Rourke elected or Mike Collier elected or Rochelle Garza or me as railroad commissioner, all of those offices can play an important role in protecting Texans and Texas consumers and making sure the lights stay on the next time it gets cold. You're right. It's it's really important. So that again, what you just said here also touches in on some, my next question for you. So recently, Texas lawmakers stated that the lack of railroad commission transparency rules really hurt Texas's ability to respond to weather emergencies. So let's explain this and talk about the 
the lack of transparency and and what we can do to change that. Um, because right now we're struggling with any change, especially when they're they're so deeply embedded in one of one another's po- pocketbooks. Yeah. So one of the the biggest problems with the Rail Commission is the lack of transparency, and this permeates the entirety of the organization. Right. It starts at the high level with the the name, simply the fact that the name is it, that it is misnamed. And that that creates confusion and limits the degree of accountability. But that those problems with transparency exist all over the place. And let me just give you a couple examples. So one example is that you know going back to the, the, this uh, pricing and monopoly pricing that I was talking about during last February's grid failure, pipeline monopolies jacked up prices that we were all paying for natural gas made literally billions of dollars in profits in one week, and then have passed those costs on to consumers. And one of the challenges in the natural gas market, and in particular, the intrastate gas market, where the pipelines are making all of this money, is that there is no transparency into how much they're buying and selling for. And so the, the pipelines just have too much power and can pay whatever they want to the producers and sell natural gas for the, the whatever they want to the power plants. And so when there's a crisis like last February's winter storm, they, instead of looking out for consumers, use that crisis to make billions in profits. And the Texas Railroad Commission let them get away with it. So that's one place where we need a huge amount more transparency. Another place where we need more transparency is on the weatherization rule and on the weatherization front. So one of the biggest causes of last February's grid failure was the lack of weatherization standard by the Railroad Commission, despite warnings going back to 2011 about natural gas producers were not prepared for cold weather. And it was the Railroad Commission's job to create a weatherization standard and enforce it. But they didn't do that. And what that was one of the biggest causes of last February's grid failure And now it's been 18 months and they still haven't created a strong weatherization rule. They actually just introduced uh, a new one that has been proposed a couple of weeks ago. And there's a public railroad commission meeting tomorrow morning at 930 that we're actually going to to testify about this rule on. But the rule, it, it talks about the need to weatherize, but it doesn't clearly outline who needs to comply with the rules, how they're going to be enforced or what the consequences for not following the rules actually are. And so there's no transparency. They're sort of just saying, hey, trust us, we got this. But they clearly don't. They clearly didn't have it leading up to the 2021 grid failure. Hundreds of Texans froze to death. And now we're seeing more of the same, no transparency and no assurances for Texans that we're safe and that we are not going to lose power the next time that the lights or that the next time it gets cold. Yeah, I know. I was I was pretty frustrated recently. Uh, there was a couple of of news he- headlines. Is we just spent the entire summer with Biden being blamed for the high gas prices, and then I was really surprised when I think it was like last week where I saw a headline that said um, oil and gas companies in Texas their profits have never been higher. And I was oh. like, oh my god! So who's paying for this? I mean, it just seems like everyday Texans, I mean, we're paying for this somehow, you know. Right. And Texans right now are paying, you know, we're paying, despite being the energy capital of the world, Texans are paying more for electricity than our neighbors in Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. And a lot of that is because of decisions that the Texas Railroad Commission made. And I want to talk about two things in particular, right? Mm -hmm. And one is the biggest source of electricity here in Texas is natural gas. We burn natural gas to make electricity. And so natural gas prices have a huge impact on how much Texans are paying for electricity. And so going back to the point I was making earlier about pipeline monopolies and the Texas Railroad Commission protecting pipeline monopoly profits, when pipeline monopolies jack up prices and the Texas Railroad Commission lets them get away with it, that increases the price that natural gas is in the market. 
So it increases how much you're paying and I'm paying for natural gas at my house, but it also increases the price that we're all paying for electricity because the, the prices increase to power plants and then are passed on to utilities and on to tech consumer. So that's one reason we're paying more. The other reason we're paying more is what Ben has called the Abbott tax, right? Which is really the Abbott and Wayne Christian tax because there was a decision, there was $3.4 billion in profits from last February's winter storm that has been passed on by the governor and the legislature and the Texas Railroad Commission had to approve this that Texans are now going to be paying for in the form of higher utility bills for decades, right? And so you are literally paying more right now because of this Abbott tax, because of the surcharge on your utility bills that has been facilitated by decisions that the people in power made in order to enrich the donors to their campaigns. Let's just be super clear about what's happening. It is the largest individual transfer of wealth in the history of our state. And we do not have to stand for it. We have the opportunity to elect new leaders this November. Yeah, absolutely. That is just absolutely enraging. Um, so let's imagine a positive thing now. So imagine today you become the, the Texas Railroad Commissioner. What is on your top list of items that to correct once you take office? And can you accomplish anything while working with two commissioners that currently retain the Republican stronghold? Because just to explain it to everybody here, is that the Texas Rail, Railroad Commission has three positions. Currently, all three are held by Republicans. And um, Luke is running for one position that is held by currently by Wayne Christian. But if he wins, there'll still be two other positions that will be held by Republicans. So, Luke, tell us, if you were to become the Texas Railroad Commissioner, what would you do and how will you work together with two other Republicans? So three really important things that we're focused on uh, in our campaign. There's obviously a huge amount that we want to do is uh, that I want to do as railroad commissioner. But let me just start with three things. First, we're running to create and enforce a clear weatherization standard so that Texans are not left living in fear that the power is going to go out next time it gets cold. Second, we're going to lower how much Texans are paying for utility prices and utility bills by holding pipeline monopolies accountable and by clawing back the bailout that the Texas Railroad Commission gave to their oil and gas executive donors and put those costs onto Texans that will be paying off for years. And third, we're going to lower the amount of emissions. Texas is the largest oil and gas, or excuse me, largest uh, greenhouse gas emitting state in the country. The oil and gas industry is the largest contributor to those emissions. And a million methane and other greenhouse gases are emitted every year because the Texas Railroad Commission simply doesn't enforce the existing rules. And I'm gonna, when I am railroad commissioner, I will take immediate action to reduce the number of flaring exemptions that are that are approved. That is a major source of those greenhouse gas emissions. So those are three things that we're super focused on on our campaign. The second question about what can we actually accomplish as an individual commissioner. So the commission, as you said, is three elected commissioners. No Democrat has served on the commission since the early, or since the early 90s. No Democrat has won an election for Texas Railroad Commission since 1990. And one commissioner, so obviously uh, in the, it's a six-year term, and in the first two years, I would be the minority on the commission. But an individual commissioner actually has a huge amount of power. So you'll remember, for example, that price gouging issue that I was talking about earlier. What should be happening is the Texas Railroad Commission should be investigating the abnormal pricing behavior and the price gouging that happened during last February's winter storm mm -hmm. and increasing the transparency and awareness to figure out if there was wrongdoing um, that occurred. They haven't done that, right? They should be working with the attorney general. They haven't done that. If I, as Texas Railroad Commissioner, even as an individual commissioner, I can direct commission resources to look into things like that. The second thing that I can do is I would significantly reduce the number of flaring exemptions that the commission uh, approves. Because what currently happens is 
the Railroad Commission passes almost everything on something called the consent agenda, where there are essentially all three commissioners approve. They introduce hundreds of items at once. Literally tomorrow, there are more than 300 items on the consent agenda. And they introduce all of the commissioners just say, I approved, and there's no debate, no witnesses, and no public hearings. And many of those things they're approving are exemptions for flaring and other things that result in unnecessary emissions and greenhouse gases being emitted. And so simply by dissenting, by calling witnesses, by calling hearings, in those first two years, I could significantly reduce the number of flaring exemptions that the Railroad Commission was able to pass. And then what I would do, and again, this goes back to the transparency issue that we talked about before. One of the biggest challenges of the Texas Railroad Commission is that people do not understand what the office does. And so I would spend every day going on the local news, screaming on social media about what the Texas Railroad Commission was doing, how it was affecting Texans, so that we could increase awareness about this really important office and how it's affecting people. And then obviously, I would work really hard to get a second Democrat elected so we could have the majority on the commission. Okay, so let's talk about that because you you went right into my next question. So, um, which brings up an important note just to everybody who's watching right now. Our work is not done in 2022. If we really want to make an impact in, in the energy section of our government, we really need to start looking at 2024 and 2026. So every single, every couple years, there's going to be an election for the Texas Railroad Commission. And um, so how important is a non-Republican majority in for the Texas Railroad Commission? How important is that so we can have work towards that goal? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important. The Railroad Commission, as we've talked about, is one of the most important elected offices in our state for our economy, for our environment, for our ability to keep the lights on. You know, we've seen 30 years of failed Republican leadership at the Texas Railroad Commission. And I'm incredibly excited about our prospects to win this November, to win this race. Um, you know, we know that we have a message that, that honestly is not super partisan. We're focused on keeping the lights on, lowering utility prices, and making sure that people have clean air and clean water. And those things are appealing to Democrats, but they're appealing to independents and Republicans as well. And so we think we have an opportunity if we do the work that we need to do and we are able to communicate with the amount of voters we want to communicate with, that we can win this November. But I want to be super clear that that is just one step towards this longer term work, right? Getting even one statewide win this November, where I think we can win up and down the ticket, but even one race will make a huge difference in the long-term trajectory of this state. Getting a Democratic foothold statewide will have a huge impact as we work to government that is more reflective of the people of the state, because we know that if everyone in Texas was able to vote and do so easily and safely, that we would have Democrat, uh, Democratic leaders elected statewide. It's just, it's been so long that people have not been able to, to access the ballot, have not been able to make their voices heard. And we have an opportunity to do that this November. Yep, I agree. 100%. Everybody, we just have to keep on looking ahead and keep on electing Democrats because in order for for us to have especially change for climate change, which is coming coming at us uh, 110 miles an hour, we need we need to work really quickly. So, super duper important. So, climate yeah. change climate change is real. Let's talk about climate change. Um this summer has been a record breaker. It has been brutal to all Texans. I don't know about you, but I joke around that this summer I became a, a farmer for straw because our yard looks like straw. I mean, it's just pure yellow and it looks terrible. So, um, and the winters here have been becoming harsh from year to year. The last couple of years, winters have been pretty tough. So what is your position on climate change and what policies do you believe we can implement to prevent further damage here in Texas? Look, I'm 33 years old. I'm the youngest Democrat to run statewide in more than 30 years. And just like everyone else my age and pretty much everyone else who's paying attention, I'm worried about the future of our planet. The Texas Railroad Commission 
has been called the most important climate election in the country because of the commission's ability to directly reduce oil emissions in the largest emitting industry in the highest emitting state in the country. You know, one of the major motivators of why I wanted to run is because I'm worried about the Texas that we are going to leave to our kids and our grandkids, right? I want to raise my family here. I want to raise my grandkids here. Um, but I, we, we are not on a trajectory right now. You know, I'm worried about the decisions that our leaders are making and the, dis- and the impact that those, those decisions will have. Look, I've dedicated my entire life to working on the intersection of energy and politics and policy in the future of our planet, right? I, you know, I advise renewable and oil and gas companies. I worked at the World Bank on international energy policy and lived in Africa, uh, in East Africa and Ethiopia for a year, working on international trade and, and thinking about how um, energy systems work in the developing world. These things are so important and so interconnected. And the decisions that our elected officials make are incredibly important. And you know, I'm obviously uh, hopeful about some of the recent action coming out of Washington, D.C. But I think, you know, like many folks, even in recent weeks, I've heard about frustration at the frustration at the federal government, right? And the thing that I always say to folks is, we don't need to wait on Washington, D.C. We can take action to protect our environment, make sure we have clean air and clean water right here in Texas by getting a Democrat elected to the Texas Railroad Commission. Thank you. That, that's great. So um, I agree with you 110 percent. I'm really I'm really worried about climate change in Texas. Um, I'm also worried about it from a different perspective in the fact that if we can do something and stabilize it, this really kind of helps us help the energy business, you know? I mean, helping, you know, us helping them help themselves by creating some stability by having a plan is always a good idea. You know what I mean? Well, and the, plan the railroad, right. Well, and, the, and to your point, the Railroad Commission has a huge role to play there, right? The commission directly oversees geothermal, which is a, a incredibly promising industry with a really uh, one, sort of one-to-one skills match with the oil and gas industry. It oversees hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage, some of these emerging technologies. And historically, Texas has been, or the Texas Railroad Commission has played a, a role in advocating for Texas energy in general, right? Not just the oil and gas industry, but the the slogan of the agency is literally leading Texas energy. And so I think as commissioner, having somebody who's young, who understands that the world is changing and that we are either going to get left behind or continue to lead. And my opponent, Wayne Christian, operates as if it's 1980, as if nothing is changing, as if It's not a problem that Texas is getting hotter because literally he has said people go on mission in places that are hot. But I recognize that the world is changing. Everyone everyone else does too, right? It is so obvious to not just folks that live in Austin and Dallas and Houston, but out in the Permian Basin, everyone sees what's happening. And again, we need leaders that see that change as an opportunity and are going to do what we need to do to set Texas up to continue to lead in the energy economy of the future. I agree 100%. So let's talk about this this tour that you just went on. You said you met with a bunch of people on this tour. So tell us about something that you learned about this on the tour that you didn't know before that that other Texans need to know about. Is there anything that sticks out? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the most exciting um, on the tour was to talk to Texans who might not have uh, voted Democrat or might not typically vote for a Democrat, right? And they, they would, you know, fo- folks, any degree of question from, hey, uh, compare yourself to AOC. Like, are you Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? And, you know, me happily saying, I'm a Texan, I'm running to do what's best for Texas. AOC is doing whatever she's doing for her district, right? Like has no impact on what I'm doing. 
and outlining my vision for the future of Texas energy. And I think it's incredibly clear with everything happening in the world that Texas, we need Texas oil and gas right now more than we have in a long time. And what we should be doing is we should be focusing on making it cleaner and safer while also expanding our leadership in wind and solar and geothermal and carbon capture. Um, and so, you know, I get all these questions about, you know, from folks that work in the industry of like, oh, am I trying to kill their jobs? And I think it's it's just the opposite in a lot of ways. You know, I growing up, my my dad was a small business owner. Um, he he owned a CD store in the '90s, and the store was down the road from where I went to elementary school. And so every day after school, I'd I'd walk there, hang out in the store. I, I literally grew up uh, after school in that CD in that CD store. But around the turn of the century. The internet was invented, file sharing was invented, and um, people stopped buying CDs. And, you know, my dad had to close the store. It had a real um, impact on our family, on him. And so when I think about, I remember that experience. That's something led me to care so much about business, to work in the private sector, to study economics. But it also allows me to, you know, when I think about the experience of folks working in the oil and gas industry, some of whom have lost their jobs, some of whom lost their jobs during COVID and aren't sure they're going to come back or they haven't come back in the same way. You know, I'm thinking about the future of, of uh, that we're going to have for those people and what their job prospects, their livelihoods, their opportunities look like. And we need somebody on the Railroad Commission who actually cares about that. Because what we've got right now, Wink Christian and the oil and gas executives who are literally billionaires who are funding his campaign, they're going to be fine as the economy changes, right? The bankers that are in New York that are funding, you know, investing in all of this, this oil and gas production, they're going to be fine. But it's Texans who have worked in these industries for years who are going to be left having to make decisions and navigate uh, an uncertain world. And so we need leaders and we need folks at the railroad committee who are actually going to look out for those people. Yeah, absolutely. So what were you hearing from rural Texans? I mean, when they met you, I mean, just, just tell us maybe one or two stories about some rural Texans that you met on the road and what, what they thought about you and, you know, what you learned from them. Just tell us a couple stories. Yeah, for sure. So I think one that um, one that sticks out is uh, people always, you know, I, I, when I'm on the road, uh, I, I usually wear a pair. I got a nice pair of cowboy boots that I, I, I bought in Austin. They're from an Austin-based brand called Chisos. I live in Austin. I'm a proud Austinite. Um, they're round toed. They, you know, they're 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 nice, but they're not beat up, right? They're not. I wear I wear them every day of the campaign, but they're not super beat up. And so I, you know, I go out to, we're at an event um, out in Pecos County and, or Presidio County, excuse me. And, um, you know, one of the first questions was like, you know, you, you got these round toe boots, like, what, what are you doing? Where are your square toes, right? And I sort of like laugh it off and then, you know, I'm a, I live in this city. These are city boots, right? I don't, I don't need to put on square toe boots to be able to, to talk to folks out in West Texas about what they're going through and what they're experiencing. I mean, I think really quickly after spending some time with people, right? They, I'm a young candidate. And so they assume that, and I get asked, you know, about AOC, they assume a lot about where I'm at, but you know, I've worked in the private sector. I care about the future of our, our economy. I, I have a deep understanding of global oil and gas markets and how the changing situation in Europe and Ukraine is going to impact the, the future prospects of Texas oil and gas producers about why that means that we need to get our emissions in order, not just from a climate perspective, but from an economic perspective so that Texas producers can compete. You know, I start talking about that stuff and you sort of see the, the 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 gears turn in folks' heads, right? They're like, "Oh, 
I've never heard a Democrat talk like that, or I didn't expect this guy to say that. So, you know, a bunch of examples like that, that were, that were really fun from the road. I think just one other I would share is we were, um, we were delayed on the train between Alpine and El Paso and, and, uh, you know, sort of stopped on the tracks. The, uh, Davis mountains were right, th- right there, like beautiful shot, the Davis mountains. And we, uh, you know, we're walking around talking to different folks on the train and a lot of people were from Texas, some weren't, they were just passing through, but we talked to this one woman who, um, was Texan and, and went up to her and said, Hey, uh, have you heard of the Texas Railroad Commission? And she was like, no. And I was like, well, what do you think it does? She was like, regulate the railroads. And I, you know, so we had this great conversation about what the Railroad Commission really does. Um, and she, you know, hadn't voted in the last couple of elections. The side was like, oh, I'm going to definitely vote for her. I gave her, you know, my, my card and everything. Um, and I just think it it speaks to the power that we all have, right? Where there are so many people in the state who might not know about this office, who might not know about the impact that it has on their lives. But when they hear about it, when they learn about it, they're super open to our message because, again, it's not super political. It's uh, we want to keep the lights on. You know, how was your experience during the grid failure? It's we want to lower utility prices because people are paying too much. It's, we want clean air and clean water. And you know, I think that's something folks across the state can get behind. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great stories. And I also think just making that human connection with somebody can yeah. really win over, can really win over people, especially you, Luke, because you're just, you're very charming. So you're fun and you're very charming. I always enjoy talking to you because you're so fun. So, um, well, yeah, <laughs> we're trying to bring some energy. You know, I mean, it's it's helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, helpful to bring some some energy to the to the um, to the race. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of like how I feel about Mothers Against Greg Abbott too. It's sort of like, hey, we're all part of this new energy momentum for Democrats winning. So we're yeah. happy, we're happy to bring some energy to that. Well, and it couldn't be like more of a contrast with my opponent, who's an empty suit, right? Who they cancel all of these meetings. He won't debate me. He doesn't want to answer questions. You know, like I, Texans are looking for someone who actually wants to solve these problems and work on them. And they're hard problems. Um, and I could not be more motivated and more excited to get into this office and be able to start delivering for the people of this state and working on and solving some of these incredibly challenging issues. So, you know, I, I hope uh, I hope folks will vote for me in the fall. Yeah, absolutely. We all need to. I hope everybody here is convinced and that we all vote for you. But let's. OK, so you, you mentioned your age a couple of times, but you know what? I, I'm a fan of just saying. Uh, it doesn't matter what age you are. I think like you have a lot of really good experience. So let's just go straight to why you're qualified for this job, what some of your experience is and what you actually bring to the table. So let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I was, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, I have a political science degree, master's in economics. Um, I have spent my whole career thinking about the intersection of politics and policy with energy and the environment, because that energy is everything, right? Nothing in society works without energy. And so um, I have worked on democratic political campaigns. I worked at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., looking at international energy policy. I worked for a small nonprofit helping uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in the energy space operate and expand. Lived in Ethiopia for a year, working at the African Union on international trade and energy uh, uh, in East Africa, in particular. Um, spent several years in consulting, where doing business strategy work, advising oil gas companies on how they were thinking about the long term of their business but also advising wind and solar and hydro companies as well. Um, I worked in tech with some of the most innovative uh, tech companies in the world. So I have an understanding of technology and where the economy is going. Um, And then my most recent job uh, prior to running for this office, I actually worked at the Texas Democratic Party, trying to get other Democrats elected 
I was the chief strategy officer there. I ran the largest registration program in Texas Democratic Party history. And I decided to run for this office because it's so important to the future of the state. It's so important to the lives of Texans. And because I think it is a real opportunity to help other Texas Democrats get elected up and down the ticket this year. Having a young, dynamic candidate driving around the state, prosecuting the case of the grid failure, and let's see, it's going to help Beto, it's going to help folks up and down the ticket, and it's going to help, uh, help uh, local candidates as well. And so we're feeling really good about where we are. A little more than two months out, we've raised five times as much as any Democrat in the history of this race to this point before. We've got some really exciting polling that we'll be announcing in the, in the coming days that shows that this race is absolutely winnable. We just need the support and the resources to be able to communicate our message to enough voters across the state. And so I'm incredibly excited about where we are. I'm incredibly excited about the prospect of serving as the next Texas Railroad Commissioner and the first Democratic Railroad Commissioner since almost the year I was born. Um, and I'm really just so honored to be with you all tonight talking about these things. Yeah, that's so that's so great. I'm super excited as well. And I uh, one of the things that, um, you know, we, we show up to a lot of the same events, like I show up and yeah. I, I always see all of you there. Um, so a while ago, I posted on Twitter, uh, like I, I kind of post, I said, I can't wait to see the slate at the Texas Democratic Convention because I want them to come out looking like the powerhouse that they are. And I want them to come out looking like the Avengers. And um, apparently I started this whole Avenger thing. So now you guys are like the Avengers, uh, the power slate, which is so fun and so great. Um, so let's talk about the slate. Like, um, tell tell me a little bit about you guys. Well, first of all, I want to tell everybody that the slate, you guys are all friends. I mean, which is pretty amazing. And yeah. You're, yeah, you're a total team, your total teamwork, your your campaigns are all friendly. What is it like, you know, campaigning together with the Avengers? Just throwing it out there. Look, we have the best statewide slate that Democrats have had in a generation. Um, from Beto O'Rourke to Mike Collier, Lieutenant Governor, Rochelle Garza for Attorney General, Janet Dudding for Comptroller, Jay Clayberg for Land Commissioner, and Susan Hayes for Ag Commissioner. We just can win up and down the ticket because we have such strong candidates. That is incredible. And to your point, we are all working together because we are all strong together than any of us is individually. And it's been incredible to be on the road with uh, other members of the slate all at the same time at convention, but even on, on smaller one-off things as well. You know, we traveled a bunch with Jay Clayberg's team before the primary runoffs. We've attended a bunch of events with Beto and the energy has just been absolutely amazing. Like the increase in energy in, in recent months really has dialed up. Texans are excited and engaged and ready to go and ready to vote for new leader. Remember, and I just think we have such an opportunity really to win up and down the ticket and to not just get a, a Democratic governor elected, but think about all of the things that Beto will be able to do even more effectively if he has Mike Collier as lieutenant governor or Rochelle Garza as attorney general or me as railroad commissioner. There's so much progress that we can make. And so many of the issues that we're talking about transcend just one off. This, right? They are going to require collaboration across different elected offices. And so getting a slate of Democrats elected is so powerful and, and is such an opportunity to make a real impact and deliver for Texans. Yeah, 110%. One of the biggest thrills I had recently, I think I posted it on my Instagram feed, was that I drove by a house and they had a Mothers Against Greg Abbott sign along with a Luke Warford sign. So I took a photograph of it and I was like, Two great things that go great together. So it was just I love cool. it. Yeah, it was it was awesome. It was really cool. I was so excited to see that. So um, so Luke, let's um so tell us how can we help you? Um, well, let's just start at the top. So where can we find you and how can we help you on the campaign trail? What are your needs right now? And um, 
just, you know, let's just, let's just do a call out for anything and everything you would want from Mothers Against Greg Abbott right now. Yeah. So I think there are, there are three things, right? One is the Railroad Commission in particular is an office that is so important, but so many people don't know what it is. So there is such a big impact that folks on this call that folks um, across the state can have simply by telling their friends about what the Texas Railroad Commission does and how it impacts their lives. And so you can do that by following us on Twitter at Luke Warford TX, on TikTok also at Luke Warford TX, by sharing a launch video or sharing the, the other video content that we put out, um, by sending out, you know, tweeting our website, et cetera. There's such an important role simply in educating Texans. The second thing people can do is they can go to our website, which is lukewarford.com, and sign up to volunteer. Um, we are going to be building a and rolling out a digital organizing program in the coming weeks to, you know, we've really focused on getting the word out digitally. And it's pretty amazing, actually. At every event I'm at, somebody comes up to me and is like, I saw you on TikTok. I didn't know about this race and I saw you on TikTok. And so it's having a real impact in terms of the reach that we have on Twitter, on, on TikTok, on other social media. And so we're going to be doing even more digitally over the coming months and folks can sign up to, to, to volunteer. And then the final thing that folks can do is they can donate. We, as I said, have raised more money uh, than any Democrat, five times as much money as any Democrat to this point in the race before. We've massively closed the cash on hand gap with Wayne Christian from $750,000 in December down to just $70,000 in June. We're going to have our best fundraising month of the campaign in August, in the middle of summer, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and the thing that we know is we know that we have a message that works in convincing Texans. And we just need to be able to get it out to enough people in order to, to understand the, the clear choice that they are facing in November. And that takes resources. So folks um, can go to lukewarford.com to donate any amount, $5, $5,000 is amazing. Um, I know many folks on this call have donated already. Uh, if you can donate again, we've got a huge fundraising deadline uh, coming up at the end of September. We have our end of month goal coming up here on Wednesday. And so really just everything that people can do to support the campaign financially with their time by telling their friends is going to make a huge difference and put us in a position where we can actually win in November and deliver change for Texans. That's great. So you heard it here. Share everything on social media, educate people, everybody you know about what this position is and what it does and why we need to elect Luke into office and donate on his website. So lukewarfer.com. And then also go sign up to volunteer. Um, and just an FYI, Luke, if you need our team to do texting for you, I got you covered. Just why don't your, your team can reach out to me and we'll get you some volunteers to help out. Amazing. So, let me know. so do you just let me know what your all's needs are? And we, I think we're ready to sign up, start like doing the texting as early as next week. So you guys just let us know what you all want and we yeah. will get some volunteers working for you. We so, love that. We'll definitely get in touch. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. So thank you so much. So um, any last words before we let you go? Anything else you'd like to share with us? Just um, thank you all for the work that you're doing. We, um, it's, I, we were talking about this before we, we hopped on the, the live segment, but, um, it's been really incredible to watch, um, the work that Mothers Against Strata has done and, and is doing and, and, um, the reach that you all have. And it's because of the work that you all are doing groups like y'all across the stat, statewide candidates like me have an opportunity to win this November. And um, that's incredibly exciting and incredibly motivating. And I'm honored to have you all uh, behind our campaign and supporting us. And, you know, we've got uh, a little over two months left to go and let's just run through the tape and, and deliver uh, deliver some statewide wins and deliver for Texans because 
there has never been more at stake than in this election. And um, I'm just so incredibly excited about, about where we are and the opportunity that's ahead of us. So thank you all so much. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so everybody, you heard it here from Luke. I mean, it's go time. We now all, we have to start showing up for, for Luke and all of our statewide candidates, as well as those that are running for House District and Senate here in Texas. It's just, it's go time. It's time to show up. So please show up and keep on um, checking the website every single day because we are going to be posting all the volunteer opportunities throughout all of Texas. And we're doing that in the morning starting this week, every single day, a different variety of ways that you all can start participating in the process to turn Texas blue. So thank you to everybody who is joining us today. And thank you so much for Luke Warford for showing up today and like educating us about what the Railroad Commission does. And um, I cannot wait to see you, Luke, next time on the camping trail. So thanks again. You have a, go you have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all. See ya. Bye.